Hello, my friend, and welcome to the Sales Podcast. I'm Wes Schaefer, the Sales Whisperer, your host. Today, I had thought I might be ready to do the book review on the Ask Method, but I'm not. I'm not. You know, well, life has a way of just uh, throwing stuff at you. I've actually, I've had a very productive two weeks, almost three weeks, um, getting down in the weeds of my own business, shifting around some of the team members, uh, rolling up my sleeves and things that I have honestly put off for too long. Uh, reading uh, Ryan Levesque's book uh, kind of triggered things, but also as I was doing research on my own analytics as I start the new year, looking to see what's working, what isn't, how to consolidate. I really got some clarity uh, over the Christmas break, working with my team, uh, streamlining, uh, narrowing the focus, uh, working on some new offers, making changes to the Make Every Sale course. Uh, I've already created the Inner Circle group, uh, so I'll be sharing more info on that in coming episodes, uh, creating a mastermind. But with everything, I don't know, uh, I'm kind of OCD sometimes with wanting things to be right, wanting my website to be right. It's my baby. You know, I've created it from scratch over all these years, and sometimes I hand it off to people, and sometimes they mess it up. And I know I need to find a true expert, but... No one will ever love your baby like you love your baby. So I've been really digging in to SEO. Uh, One of the guys that I had on the sales podcast a while back, and I linked to him in the episode and the show notes, and uh, our guest today brings him up. Uh, His name is Brian Dean. He owns Backlinko. Uh, I actually coincidentally read uh, a post and watched a video he had put out just a couple weeks ago. Uh, Phil brought that up, and that kind of triggered some things. And so that's where I've been really knee deep, uh, in my website. And I mean, knee deep head first. So, uh, I've still been going through Ryan's book. So that's the other thing I'm trying to implement the ask methodology correctly while also updating 1100 pages on my website, tightening up the SEO, tightening up the offers, making better pages, making better content. Uh, I get into that with Phil and, you know, as luck would have it, I don't know. Well, maybe it would have been better if if he was on when he was scheduled because he was supposed to be on a few weeks ago. I think he got sick or I don't know, had a schedule conflict. So uh, he was on today. And so I I spent the day still working on some things and implementing a couple of things he mentioned. And um, so I'm making the intro and the outro uh, the same day of the interview. I'll get this to my team. They'll they'll uh, do the cleanup, the ID tags, create the artwork. So it'll be really less than 24 hours from the time that, uh, that I interviewed Phil to the time this goes live. So he is uh, the author of a new book with John Jantz. So we talk about that. Uh, the guy really is an SEO expert. He's uh, a very humble guy. Uh, what you see is what you get. We talk about his uh, humble background right in the very beginning. So get ready for that. So he, you know, he learned this from the bottom up. And those are the kind of people that I like. Uh, but he's also still doing it. And for those of you that may be wondering, you know, is there still a place for SEO? Is SEO needed? Uh, the answer is definitely yes, which is why I had him on the show, which is why I think you'll benefit from this. Be ready to take some notes. We talk about a few technical little things, um, but I, I do have the notes in the uh, in the show notes on the blog post. Uh, I am in the middle of researching uh, options for getting this transcribed. That's one of the things we discussed and uh, why that should be done. Also working up uh, a new business venture, something I've pondered for quite some time. And then he drove home the point that uh, I'm on the right track. I'll tell you about that later, but I've already um, had discussions with someone about that. So it's tough. You know, you as an entrepreneur, you get um, you're interested in a lot of things. We got to be careful. You can have too many irons in the fire. Uh, And I have learned that the hard way. Uh, but there are times when op- opportunity strikes and you need to strike hard you know, while the iron's hot. Um, but if you know how to do it, if you know how to outsource to the right people, uh, partner up, things like that, it, it can be very lucrative. Uh, and again, I've learned that the hard way as well. But enough of that. Um, as I mentioned uh, earlier, be on the lookout for 
new information on the inner circle. Uh, the Make Every Sale program is going to be modified. It's going to be an on-demand program. And then the inner circle is where you will get the live access, the weekly calls, uh, a lot more uh, support on a regular basis. Uh, and I'm calling it that because I do get into a lot more than just sales. Whereas the Make Every Sale course is going to be purely sales training. Okay, but you can still get that at makeeverysale.com. But now let's bring on our guest. Bill Singleton, is it true that you got a D in computer science and now you're going to talk to me about Google and SEO? What the what? Tell me about it. I'm, I'm like the <laughs> least likely guy to be running a, a digital marketing agency. <laughs> Or even really be on a podcast, I think. But, <laughs> but um, a lot's changed since college. So, hey, dude, I'm the same way. I, I hated computers. I remember. Oh, I mean, I literally hate them. I took a computer programming course in high school, and like my buddy, he just he was kind of a geek, and he had an Apple II or whatever. So he just helped me. I think the, the teacher. It was my senior year. He took pity on me. And then I had a computer programming class at the academy, and uh, hated it. But the teacher was like, if you would show up after hours, like for extra instruction, he basically wouldn't fail you and he'd kind of show you how to code. So then fast forward, and now I'm never off of a computer. Right. Crazy, this huh? Is life, life the way it is right now. Yeah, my so story man, was, uh, I, um, yeah. my college class I got a D in. I remember my, my buddy that we were um, lab partners with, part of our final exam was like on a computer. Yeah, this is back, and it's like it was still black and green screens, when, you know, green text type of a thing, DOS or whatever it was. But we turned unplugged the the monitor and just pretend like it was broken, <laughs> and that was uh, that's that's <laughs> that was as good as it got, man. That was that's awesome. Yeah. <laughs> so I mean, there's all types of information and misinformation and myths about SEO. Um, obviously back in the day you could game things, keyword stuffing and what have you. Now I'm hearing that even long tail keywords are no longer that much of a thing because of artificial intelligence, Google's kind of understanding the intention. So, I mean, can we get into like medium tail keywords, latent semantic indexing and all these fancy things? I mean, I kind of want to get in the weeds today. Yeah, I mean, we can go we can go as deep as you like. I mean, one of the things I think is is um, that I really like about SEO today is one, I think it's more relevant than ever. I mean, two three years ago, three point five billion searches a day. Last year, five point five billion searches a day. More and more content going on the internet. Obviously, Google's kind of the gatekeeper. The way we go search for um, you know for information, so it hasn't gotten any less important. It's probably more important than it is. But yeah, the way people get their uh, information, their websites to rank. Uh, has changed quite a bit in the last five to six years. The first 15 years of SEO was a lot of game in the system, right? Doing stuff right. Like under the hood on the website, trying to create pages and content just for ranking purposes. And a lot of it, of course, was based on, um, you know, volume based link building. So the cool thing I think with, with, with what um, S has happened with SEO today is if you're just doing good strategic um, content marketing, you've got a website you're invested in and growing it and trying to make that the referral source for all of your, uh, all of your content, you can, um, you can get a lot of really good SEO traction just by lining things up the right way and producing good content. And uh, yeah, I think so to me, it becomes a lot less, you know, I've got this, I'm holding this up. I know you're mostly, um, uh, audio, but this is the art of SEO. It's a thousand word textbook. It's the third, um, edition. The first edition was 500 pages. The second edition was 750. The last edition last year is a thousand words, you know, textbook of how to get under the hood. You don't really don't have to do all as much of this stuff anymore. If you get your website lined up right and kind of align all your, your digital marketing on back onto your website the right way, you can actually still get some really good um, traction and, and enjoy the benefits of uh, organic traffic. Well, so let's look at, let's talk about two things. One, let's talk about the rookie or somebody just getting started uh, on how should they do SEO right? And then, because I'm greedy and selfish, uh, let's talk about somebody with an old website. How do we tighten things up uh, to make uh, an old dog perform new tricks? Yeah. Well, for the first thing, I mean, we see, because part big part of my agency is, you know, I've actually got three active websites that draw in 
um, leads for us. And you know, 80, 90% of my leads aside from referrals are coming from organic searches. So most of the time I've got a web design website, I've got an SEO services website, and I've got a, just a, like a generic marketing services website. The vast majority of leads come from guess which one it's the web design web. Cause it's most people, mm. you know, when they're looking for web design, it doesn't really matter what size of company, most small businesses, businesses in general, looking for lead generation. A lot of times they, okay, I think their website's broken. So they look for web design really more than anything else. Somebody that people, we do get traffic for, for SEO. We rank highly for that, but that's an educated person. So it all really, to me, starts with the website because they're still marketed and pitched as digital brochures. I think a lot of businesses, whether you're a solopreneur or a marketer or a small business, they're still treated as kind of a static sunk cost of doing business. And they're really not treated like a marketing platform, which is what how everybody um, should be using them. And I think that's really the main thing. And, and they're pitched on, you think about any commercial that you see that has anything to do with web design on the, on the, tel- on the television is, is um, you know, the Wix, the Weeblies, the GoDaddies, the Squarespaces, get your website up for $50 a month, get listed on Google. That's all you need to do. It's kind of pitched more as an expense um, rather than an investment type of thing. That's the biggest problem I think most businesses have is they still have that mentality where they think a website's a sunk cost and they don't think of it as a marketing platform. Um, So they'll set it up once as a digital brochure. And if if they do anything online, they're going to do kind of off the website. So they'll get, if they put their best stuff up on maybe social media where it has one chance to pass under the river and it kind of dies, right? It never gets archived in, a, in the place where it should be. So it could be looked up as an answer to somebody's question. I think that's really for the newcomer or somebody really looking to, 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 um, to benefit from organic is to stop thinking of the website as a digital brochure as kind of a stepchild, maybe of, of your, your marketing or your website and think of it more um, as a, as a marketing platform and make it the referral source for everything that you're doing. Because you get a lot of people that will go out, they'll build a website, they'll go do TV and advertising or radio, no digital trail back to the website. They'll go do something on social media where it dies, no digital trail back to the website. We want to put everything, all of our best content on our website and make people come back to it so that it can become an answer to somebody's question. One, but also so you can be doing all these cool things, CRM, marketing automation, you know, retargeting, dropping a pixel on the website so you can stalk people. That all happens at the website level, right? And that's the one thing that you own. Mark Zuckerberg doesn't own your website. You do, right? So yeah. um, you want everybody coming back there. I think that's a huge thing that people just don't, they think of things you know, in terms of doing these hip shots versus setting the website up and then making everything come back to it that way. And that's, that's by far, it's been the problem for many years. And I think it's still really um, a big issue to this day. Yeah. So you mentioned something inter- interesting about your three websites and uh, the one with the most leads is, is a web design. And, and I've seen that all along. I talk to people about it. You know, it seems like most people are looking for the pretty stuff. And it's like, I guess they just don't understand under the hood, right? They're, they're literally just buying a car because it's pretty with no understanding of, you know, do you need, do you commute a lot? Do you need, you know, good gas mileage, uh, are you, uh, into muscle cars? And so buy the ugly one, but it's got better horsepower and, and, you know, it can, it can distribute power better, you know, to the wheels. So is that just, that's just human nature, isn't it? Everybody looks for pretty. Uh, I think they do. I definitely think, and I think people think of their websites again, kind of as that digital brochure, I'll make it, it's a captive audience. I'll put it out there. Um, but really, if we're going to start digging into the website, I think, you know, you, you talked to the, the start of the show about um, root keywords, long tail keywords, all these kind of other things um, that have come into play. Uh, I still think keyword research is still one of the most important parts of any type of organic pr- uh, process, really in terms of digital marketing in general, because you know, everybody wants to know who their ideal client is. And there's all sorts of tools where you can go out there to know exactly how the search behavior is of your ideal client. And if you can get that information ahead of time, and then reverse engineer your website around search activity versus most of the way websites are designed today is you get a graphic design person and a business owner and they think, here's how we're going to present my business to the world online. It really right. shouldn't be like that. It should be, let's do the research to see how people are searching for products and services, how they consume content. And let's build a website around that behavior. Huge benefit in SEO if you think of it that way then right. that can help you dictate what content goes on the, first, on the homepage. What other pages might you need in terms of maybe serving a vertical? There might be some other verticals out there you haven't thought about 
um, that search for your product and services in a certain way. And if you can use that search behavior to help you kind of carve up and actually create the navigation on your website, huge competitive advantage instead of trying to do that after the fact when it's already built. So knowing that um, how your contents consume, your, your, um, your, your ideal clients consume content and knowing the, what kind of actual phrases and keywords they go after still, I think more, more important than ever. But you know, you got into some of the things about, I'm holding up hummingbird here, which is, was one of the Google updates, which got around that semantic, you know, touches on AI type things where people are trying to, you know, Google's trying to serve up based on intent versus matching keywords to, to phrases on a website, super important, but it still comes back to, to some degree, it comes down to keyword research. It's just a matter of knowing what the intention is and making sure your content is on the websites there to capture, you know, the, the ideal clients as they come to the site. You still, it still comes down to people are still searching words in a, in a phrase in a box, right? And it's right. still coming up and, and, and answers are still coming up either on a website or through even a vo- voice search result. It still is a very important part of, um, of the process. It's just, I think when it comes down to what kind of content and, and trying to say, I'm not going to try and like start uh, stuffing keywords onto a page just to try and match them up. Like in the old ways, we're going to actually try and create good content in, in, in various forms of the way people are talking and, and, um, and presenting this content. So we got a chance to show up uh, where we need to show up. So what are good slash affordable SEO tools. Cause I, I, there's a lot of things out there. Uh, I don't know, spy foo and um, SEM rush. And but a lot of these seem to be pretty dang expensive. And it's like they're built almost for the agency that's doing this full time, but what's the, the solopreneur or small business owner to do? Uh, should they be investing in tools like this that are hundred or $200 a month, SEO Moz, things like this, or, can they do a little bit of research? Can they use Google Webmaster tools or Keyword Planner, use free tools and still, you know, do a decent job? Great. And great question. I mean, there are, you know, some free ones out there. I use Ahrefs a lot and SEMrush for my agency. Yeah. Is every, if somebody wants to do it themselves, is that a viable one? Probably not unless they're really going to go after, you know, and use, and use that on an ongoing basis. But I still love Keyword Planner. Um, great information great. It's the source, um, to get info. And then you mentioned webmaster tools, boy, that's really gotten this you know, Google search console now very powerful. If you've got access, you know, historical access to your, to your website and haven't just set it up. Um, but if you've had it, uh, up and running on your website for a while, you can get all sorts of great information. I, we use that quite a bit, but to me, that's a little bit, if you're trying to get your website set up, maybe right for the first time, keyword planner is a great place to get some, some information, a great, another great place is one of, I think probably one of the best places is if you have the benefit of having an existing AdWords campaign, that's fantastic. Cause you can go in there and check in through the dimensions tab and actually get the exact phrases that people have used um, to click through your, your alive AdWords campaign over the course of a long period of time. And great way to get, uh, you know, get action on those commercially viable terms. If not, you can go through the free version of the keyword planner, um, and still great, again, great information to at least get you started. But then after you've got that, you've been able to kind of pin down what your keyword terms are and you've maybe updated your website, your browser titles, maybe try to make some adjust- adjustments on your, your um, page titles on your website and any actual you know, copy. Um, and I think one overlooked thing people still overlook to this day is they don't go tag the images on their website. Great place to go in, you know, especially on WordPress, very easy to go into the media center. Um, and drop a keyword that's related to the, the images that you use on your website. Um, those things you can all pair up and, and find great info through Keyword Planner for free. Um, but, but on top of that, what ends up happening is once you've got that base info, it doesn't really stop there. I think where you really get a huge benefit in, in, in gaining um, some more SEO rank off of the momentum that you get from maybe doing some initial research is going back and monitoring that Google search console. Okay. I do this all the time for my own, own site and actually on um, client websites where you can go in and look at the type of traction that you're getting and things that are moving around. And then as you see things getting more impressions or more clicks um, on a certain page for a certain phrase, you can maybe go in and try and beef that up or use it a little bit more and start to work it in a little bit differently if you see yourself starting to get traction on Google Search Console. So other tools I think are really good at this, like if you use Ahrefs, they have their own little um, 
section of the website where they'll show you where you're getting more traction for certain words on a certain page. And then again, you can kind of go back and keep revising those pages and maybe make them longer, add to them, make them, make them better, put more content on them, put more rich media on them if you see them and keep gaining on the momentum that you're getting from the, from the tracking that you're doing in Google search console, or if you have one of those premium tools, but it's a, that's a great hack. It's one that works all the time. Um, but what we're seeing in SEO, you know, a lot these days is more, um, better rankings for less content. So you got a lot of guys in the last 12 months or so that are going and looking over the course of their whole website, finding website that don't finding web pages on a site that maybe don't have any traction on them and actually maybe even deleting them or not using them or redirecting them and focusing on the ones that are getting more content and actually making those richer and better. So they've got a chance that are maybe ranking for competitive terms and really trying to kind of go after those. And a lot of guys out there, in fact, I just saw something Brian Dean of Backlinko put out, I think a, a month or two ago, where he's going out and they're shaving down off old, you know, right. thinner pages and then just trying to make the websites uh, narrower and deeper, basically. All right. Okay. I'm glad you brought that up because, yeah, I know Brian. I had him on a few years ago and I was reading that same article. But So when you say better rankings for less content, it, would you say less pages? Less, sorry, less, pages. less frequent content, right? Um, so you don't need uh, a 300 word blog post every single day. You're probably better off with one 1500 blog, uh, 1500 word blog post a week. Right? I think it gets really interesting. This is an excellent point. Cause I'm having this conversation with some of our clients right now. There's no question that longer form content ranks better for competitive terms. Well, you guys out there like Neil Patel and Brian, uh, Brian Dean, all these guys, you know, they're posting less, but they're posting almost like guide type forms. But the problem that comes with for myself and, and for other smaller businesses is having those weekly posts. Um, first of all, they can still compete for if you're, if you're trying to compete locally or even in some kind of a niche where maybe your competitors aren't just being active. But second of all, it's a great way to get uh, social activity. So part of our process is, okay, we do these blog posts on a weekly basis. They're 500 to 600 words. Um, but when they go on the website, we're automatically posting them out to social media. So having a good blog post on a consistent basis gives you a little bit more presence actually in your social media channels that drives people back to the website, where if you're only doing that once, you're not having that activity unless you're actually doing that, which a lot of you know small business owners, small businesses aren't going to do. So one of the things that we're getting around right now is we're saying, okay, we're still going to stick on the weekly blogging program because we know that it works. It also works into a different part of a strategy, which I'm going to explain here in a second. But we're trying maybe almost maybe on a quarterly basis to do long form posts of maybe two to 3000 words. Right. Okay. So we're working on those big, long guide type things for competitive keywords. Um, but we're also kind of keeping that routine in for the weekly posts. Another reason for doing the smaller weekly posts is um, we, part of our strategy is works for myself, works for a lot of clients is, we, anytime we do a, a, you know, a weekly blog, we're doing it in terms of a series. So we'll do 10 or 15 blog posts, but we're doing it in the form of a table of contents so that at the end of that 10 or 15 week period, we can stitch them into an ebook that can be then used as a call to action on the website. Then we take it a step further. We'll take that ebook and turn it into a Kindle, make our business owners authors up on Amazon so that then we can then start working on their personal branding and authority. Um, right. Another thing that we've been doing the last six to 12 months has been trying to take those Kindle eBooks and then actually trying to do podcast guesting campaigns for those advanced content marketing clients that we have. So you just off one blog strategy. Again, where it's all keyword based. You're thinking about long tail keywords, but you're literally repurposing in a way with a high ROI. Um, that really works. So, so those small chapter like blog posts that you can repurpose are, I think, really important because um, they give you so much different, you know, so many wins. Uh, as opposed to just growing the website out, you know, on a blog post by blog post basis. So are you saying, let's say you've got a, a 15 chapter article. Do you say, Hey, this is article one of 15 over the next 15 weeks, you know, subscribe here to get the update as soon as it comes out and then link to it. Or, you know, would you have like all 15, but no links. And then as you add the second and the third, you make the link active on the, we don't, we just kind of have the clients post them out singly as independent blog posts. Okay. So if people, but they, people do, it doesn't ever become an issue where they're just like, okay, part one of series two, it ends up being a series, but they're right. just, it's not, we don't mention them in the post. And at right. the end, there's actually a blog post, maybe a call to action download on the website. 
that content still maybe throughout the website, you know, peppered out through blog posts and things like that. But yeah, we don't, right. we're not doing it that way. So, so talking about Brian, um, you know, I was reading that article and he had a story on some, some company had, I don't know, like 43,000 yeah. things indexed and they cut like 90% of them uh, and their traffic grew. And so I, I literally did this. Uh, we started going, I went through my entire website in the last uh, two weeks. So 1,125 posts. Uh, and so I'm consolidating. I'm starting to build more epic uh, posts. I realized I got some old stuff out there, nine, 10 years old. It really was just junk. <laughs> I'm like, oh my gosh, what? Like, was I drunk when I wrote this? Um, but, it, but some just didn't relate. And because of the volume, I just deleted some. I deleted and or just unpublished and, and archived and now I'm seeing in my Google Web, Webmaster Tools, you know, it's seeing some errors, some 404s. Uh, should I worry about those? Will Google just eventually say, okay, that, that's no longer part of it and just drop it, you know, or, or should I take the time to redirect or go tell Google, hey, go de-index these because they're gone? I, I personally would redirect them some to my site that made sense. The other thing I'd be doing, I think, and he also, I think, recommended this in his post, um, you know, it's before you start trimming, you may have some pages that actually rank and get traffic, even though it's not the be- one that you're proud of. Right. Um, so, you know, something like that, I would actually recycle well, and they, work they were, on that. Yeah. If, yes. if something got traffic, yeah. I, I you was, were leaving uh, it. Yeah. But, cool. but like I, I used to have like this uh, useless fact series. So I, I'd have my weekly whisper newsletter. And for a while, I toyed with this useless facts just to send people back to the site give them a little chuckle, but to bring business back. But then these useless facts started getting in there. I, I should have no index, no followed them uh, because they were really only meant for my readers that already knew who I was versus some stranger just popping in to see how many stitches on a baseball. Right. You know, so now I'm like, so super, you know, hundred percent bounce rate. I mean, just and had nothing to do with my business. So I'm like, I'm just killing these, you know, because, yeah. because I, I was all, I was always torn. It they were they were great sources of traffic, but then it's the wrong traffic. So I was like, that seeing that article finally just convinced me kill these things. You're, you'll probably um, you know, it's a big project to do if you got 1,100 pages. The other guy had it was a huge informational site, like you said, forty thousand pages or something. Yeah, so perfect sense for somebody like that. Uh, but it makes sense with what Google's coming out. They don't want a big website with a lot of thin pages or stuff. The more you can narrow it down, uh, really makes a lot of sense. I still think 1,100 pages on something that's niche focused is not a huge site or anything but first for if you got posts that you know strategically don't make sense and that's you're doing the exact right thing on that one of the things i've done to help even my own long form it's really helped out has um, been i've been over like 50 podcasts in the last 12 months i did it for a lot of different reasons i started because i thought it was a great way to get natural backlinks and it is and there's been so many other benefits that have come along with it Um, but i finally started to do my own podcast and one of the reasons i've done it is because I've been actually taking a lot of people don't do this. I don't think you did it on, on your site. Some do, some don't, but I'm actually transcribing every um, episode. Right. Right. And each one, uh, 20 minute blog, uh, 20 minute podcast has got about five to 6,000 words. So I'm going that I'm going through rev.com. I'm posting it up. I'm actually trimming them out a little bit more like blog posts. I'm putting, uh-huh. uh, I'm putting uh, quotes in them. I'm putting uh, subtitles on them. I'm linking them throughout the page. So the crawler was is, is incentivized to go down to the page and they're right. I mean, and I've already got some stuff cause I've been working on my website, obviously for, for years in terms of SEO. So it's got a lot of authority on, but my, uh, they're starting to rank really high for competitive terms. You do SEO oh, nice. benefits of podcasting ranks number one. I did one on attorney SEO tips and I'm doing each one of my podcast episodes. I'm actually, I'm interviewing the person but I'm also got a strategic keyword that I'm going after too. So sure. it all kind of comes into that SEO mindset on it. But right. I did one lady on, um, uh, for attorney SEO and you type in attorney SEO tips rank number four in like two weeks. Wow. Um, because it's long form. I went after it. I asked her the questions. I'm you know, obviously trying to give great information for my audience, but I'm also going as like, it's a great way to get five or 6,000 words that if I do it the right way, it's going to be a long form post and it's probably going to rank and that's working really good so for me personally what's working is i'm doing my own blog posts i concentrate on 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 some longer ones but having a podcast where you transcribe them and spend a little extra time on dressing them up like long form blog posts huge opportunity there huge opportunity there 
Um, and it's only like 20, 30, it's 20, it's like a buck a minute on rev.com. It's, it's great um, to do it. So that's one of the ways I've been kind of getting around my own long form thing. Plus it's just a lot of fun and it's easy. Um, yeah. but that's working for me. So you might wonder though, after I've got a hundred or 200 episodes, am I going to run into this problem where I've got, you know, too much content, things like that, but so far so good. Um, so yeah, so I'll link to rev.com. I've seen that I've considered it, but I mean, you make a good argument for it. Um, and so it's just, it's a dollar a minute, whether there's one speaker or two or, or whatever. Uh, yeah. It's just a dollar a minute. And it's, it's yeah. uh, there's another one called Temi, TMI.com. And that's a, like an AI one. It's, it's like 90% accurate, but the problem is you can't, it's a pain in the butt to be 90% accurate. It means you have to read to the whole thing and there's too many things to change. Rev.com is an actual human editor. So it's like pretty much flawless unless they don't understand some of the, the businesses you're talking about. But, um, right. and then it, t- but it takes a little extra time for me to go in and actually drop the H2 subtitles pull sure. out quotes, but it's still a lot easier than writing a thousand word blog post myself. Again, that's one of the reasons why I got into this. I was like, God, if you get on, if you get guested on somebody else's podcast, this is the best SEO tactic I've had in like 12 years. It's the easiest. You go on and talk, you bring your best information on. Um, you try and go out there. A lot of, a lot of, uh, um, you know, it's a great SEO tactic that still works, but it's getting very spammy is of course, guest blog posting. So people going out doing outreach, trying to get these guest blog posts on third-party websites that are paying their way in or trying to get the best content out there. But it's a pain, man, to go out there and try and get your content posted on somebody else's website. 1,000, 2,000 words, got to be really good stuff. If you're lucky, you get a backlink that helps you out. You get pitched, they're getting spammed, they reject it a lot. Lots and lots of work. And it's not really about you. So there's all these things that, 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 um, that you're just trying to get maybe a mention or maybe an author bio and a credit link at the end, which is less valuable than actually getting in the post. Whereas if you go out and get guested on somebody else's program, you're spending 20 or 30 minutes. The whole episode is about you. You get backlinks back to relevant things. You're earning them the way Google wants you to earn them. Um, super, super powerful way to get uh, fantastic backlinks on it. It's been really the most powerful thing I think that's out there is to go out there and, and get guests on relevant uh, podcast uh, then there's this reverse piece of it where you know i was i looked into this as a like, gosh it's after 50 episodes i gotta get my own podcast up because i'm i'm losing the benefit of actually having this kind of content on my site so that by itself i think there's a lot of uh, missed opportunity and it's it's probably i think the number one seo tactic on the market right now is is guesting campaigns because yeah. People that have podcasts, and yours is a great example. I looked it up on Ahrefs. you got a domain authority in Ahrefs of 50, super high quality. You're in the sales digital marketing space. I'm earning a spot on it by trying to give some of my best stuff. I'm going to get a backlink back at least probably to one of the websites that I own, earning it back. And it's just one of these things where it really just kind of adds that um, that additional power. And this stuff like really, really works. So, Oh, I thought you wanted to be on my show just because I had a pretty smile. <laughs> all the above but you you've got um you've got the smile you've got the sight you got the quality you got the domain authority you got it all man very nice <laughs> um so let's give our listeners some some lingo I, I mentioned latent semantic indexing lsi can you explain that for mere mortals well i'm just going to boil that down when people talk about lsi and this stuff they're t- really talking about semantic wording and that is to me it's like the synonyms and the things that um to try and explain the context or the intent behind the words people are actually searching for. So again, the old school of, um, of search engine optimization, it was so much one-to-one. It was like match. This is the way the search, original search engine, optim, uh, search engine from Google was, uh, was coded. I mean, it was link based and it was matching a phrase to a phrase on a page much less about that right now. Now it's really trying to figure out, okay, here's a word. Let's try and use our AI and our algorithm to try and figure out what the intent is behind the phrase versus just trying to use our algorithm to go scrape the page and see where that shows up on the page. So um, being able to know how people are searching, but then actually taking it to the next level and, um, building great content that relates to those types of words, I think is really important, but I think it's confusing to some, what does that mean? Still, what does that mean to the layman? Like, what am I trying to accomplish there? What's like, if you tell people that keyword research is really important and I still think it really is, um, you have to take it with user intent because I still think when you tell people keywords, 
they just think keywords and they still think a little bit like in this keyword stuffing type of a mentality. Like you told me keywords, I want to make sure that phrase is on the page. Well, that's important, but um, to kind of hit these LSI marks and things like that, you want to have a lot of different variations of that, right? Synonyms, antonyms, you want to have all sorts of things that are on there that relate to that phrasing, but you got to make sure that you're working it into the page copy in a way that, that serves the, the user first and not just the search engine. That's why I think if you, if you, if you know who your ideal client is and your audience is, and you know what um, the way people search for things and you develop like an SEO mindset, which means you're still developing content for your user, but you're not ever doing it without thinking at least about SEO. That's where you really kind of, I think, get the balance. Because I think too many people just create content without thinking about SEO at all. And there's also this other part, part um, audience which thinks only about SEO and then the stuff doesn't make a standard. It's not high enough quality to get any type of engagement off of it. So you're really trying to manage that balance. Um, okay. But, but, um, but, but thinking about SEO and making sure that you're getting the full benefit is the way to kind of get, make sure that you're going to have the highest search and ranking potential. And there's other, I'm going to, I'll, I'll send it to you in the, um, in the show notes. I can't think about it, but there's also, there's some LSI tools out there where you can go in and type in, a phrase and they'll give you a little universe of keywords around it so that you know, Hey, we're hitting on, on maybe synonyms or maybe even other types of subjects or topics that are related to this topic that will help you kind of hit some of those LSI marks. I can't think about the top of my head. Do you know what I'm talking about? We no. see the little, there's little, it, it's a pretty cool little tool, but it's free. Oh, okay. Um, but now you're not saying that doing LSD makes you better with LSI, right? I mean, you're not saying that. No. Okay. Right. <laughs> <laughs> but it might. For some, for some people, it might. I don't know. <laughs> Steve Jobs, are, you know, he, he attributed a lot of his uh, ingenuity from uh, dropping acid. But uh, I don't recommend that either. For a split either. second, I was like, did he catch me on a new SEO term? I was like, that's really cutting edge. It really Come on, is. man. Mind-blowing. Mind-blowing. <laughs> uh, no kids. We only recommend maybe a little whiskey now and then, but that's, that's about it. Uh, what about other free tools? Uh, for the longest time, I used WordPress. Uh, my site's now hosted with HubSpot. I moved everything over to them a few years ago. Uh, but I, I was a big fan of Yoast SEO. I mean, is that still a big year? And are you a fan of WordPress even before we get into Yoast? I mean, a, so still a good <laughs> tool for blogging and for SEO. I, I love it. I mean, there's a lot of different reasons. Um, of course, HubSpot's obviously awesome for lots of different reasons. But, you know, I came into this from the outside and we talked about kind of my background. I'm not a graphic designer. I'm not a coder. Did my first website, 35 years old. Um, the ugliest little one page, Microsoft front page thing you could ever imagine. But got into web design really because that's the race car and the NASCAR race of, you know, organic. You have to make sure that you have the that piece, right? So we had to be good web designers really to get, to make sure that we had the, the best um, chance to rank. Well, for me, that's evolved over time. It's really been on WordPress. WordPress is awesome, free and open source, obviously huge repository of plugins, um, great plugins out there that people support. And obviously you can go in and, and plug your way to lots of different features for, for free or for cheap. Um, Yoast is obviously you mentioned S one kind of basically a standard for, for applying basic on page SEO to website in terms of the you know, page titles and, and meta descriptions and things like that. Uh, very well supported. But what the reason I like WordPress a lot is because I've been able to, in the last year, I've developed my own schema plugin for structured data. Mm. So we didn't touch on this, but this is a, a, like a really super important part of SEO in the last two years. Um, I went out there and I couldn't find a structured data uh, plugin that enabled me to add it to the pages in the newest form of markup, which is date JSON LD. There's a couple other HTML based ones. There wasn't one in this newer form that Google has now favored. And if we talk about structured data and schema for a minute, what that is, is it's basically just um, a standardized set of extra code that you can tag data on your website to tell Google what it is and add this context. So we've been talking about it. So you tell Google, um, give some of them some additional meaning and information behind some of the content that's on a website. What do I mean by that? Well, you see this manifest a lot in the, the search um, results when you go and see a star rating show up or when you see an in the search, inside the search results, or you see um, an event show up, or you see these things like knowledge boxes, position zero come up, right? 
where it's above the first organic rank and you're seeing like an actual picture, maybe some bullets and they're trying to provide you with an answer. Um, a lot of that's tied into voice search because a lot of times those things are being read off as the answer to a question or a problem or solution. But it's also, uh, you know, one of these things where you're starting to see this more in these rich results. Well, a lot of this is based on being able to properly apply an extra layer of SEO co code called structured data and schema markup, right? So you go in there and say, okay, Google doesn't necessarily want to guess if you've got somebody's review on your web page just because you put a review on there. But if you go in there and tag it with this code that says this is a review on there, they're going to be much more likely to actually show that up in the search results. So I did my own plugin over the last year where it enables people almost like on this Yoast basis to go on to pages and post and say, okay, I've got a recipe on here. I've got a, this is a blog article. This is a regular article. This is, there's a video on here. So we can actually add those little pieces right in there in a form fill type of a way where you can add this extra layer of code so that you got a better chance to show up maybe as a, vo as a voice result or get that extra, you know, rich data information up in, in the knowledge boxes and extra data, extra search engine bling um, up in the organic search results. So WordPress is awesome because a guy like me, not I got a D in computer science, here it is, you know, 15, 20 years later, I'm actually developing my own plugins for, for WordPress that I wouldn't be able to do necessarily on like a HubSpot or a closed platform program where they don't have it opened up. So that's great for somebody that really likes to really super tinker and get in there. I think WordPress is still, is still really, um, really great and still got a lot of potential and is growing, still growing very fast. Yeah. So what about voice and video? I mean, as we go into, you know, Hey Siri, Hey Alexa, I mean, where does SEO fall into that? It's there. I mean, one of the things I'm banking on is if we, if we mark the pages up correctly, um, and get a better chance to show up um, in that position zero, a lot of times you're seeing those show up as the answers for, you know, like the Google Assistant and that kind of stuff. Is it always going to be like that? I don't know. But if you mark your pages up the way Google's asking you to mark them up, because they want you to, they're, they're giving all these like, tools and instruction and guides out there for you to go in there and say, please, please mark your pages up this way so that we, so that there's some kind of a standard. Because the way people put what, you know, stuff on websites right now, you're still just basically in a lot of cases, just putting it up there, right? We link to it. You put the page title and there's certain things, but there's nobody, there's a lot of the websites that are out there aren't marked up, meaning they don't, the pages don't have like the tags and the anatomy to give Google the extra confidence it needs to serve it up as an answer, like in a voice. Because the one thing with a voice you don't have in like a phone or on a, uh, on a computer is, you know, we get 10 choices when we type on, on, um, on Google search on a computer, right? But on search assistants, I mean, you're getting like one answer, right. you know, or one in succession, unless you ask it again. So they got to have a lot more confidence that you have the quality answer that you need to answer somebody's question. And I think marking your pages up with this extra set of search engine code, structured data and ski with schema markup is the way to try and to communicate to Google that you should be considered as the answer to one of these, these questions. So, you know, voice is just one of these things where I think, is it going to replace, it's going to replace certain things like when you're in a car, but I mean, people still want the power of Google, I think is being able to see lots of stuff instantly um, right. and not just say, okay, I just came up once. That's the one type of thing. Are you telling your clients uh, to do more video? I mean, how important is video now in being found being building a connection, getting opt-ins. Cause I mean, ultimately that's what we're trying to do, right? We're not trying to I always tell people you don't need any more traffic. You know, they're like, what? And I'm like, you need more conversions. Yes. You know, maybe you need more traffic, but maybe you need more conversions, you know? So uh, where does video fall? In I that? think video is huge, but I look at it a couple different ways. One is again, I'm gonna get back to Brian Dean. Cause he's, um, he's come up with a lot of these things are really kind of, he zeroes in on stuff for the right reasons. But one of the things he's come out with, I just think of him when I think about this is, um, you know, a lot of SEOs in the last two years have been talking about shying away from bounce rates, right? And, and using that in terms of any kind of a measure and concentrating more on dwell time, which means how long somebody stays on a page. Um, and, a, and then that's correlating a lot with ranking. So some of that could be the long form content, great long form. Somebody stays, they read out more. I think it has to do a lot more with um, having great rich data, rich uh, information on it. So a video 
and I love podcasts for this, but I think video is also really great because if you get somebody to click on something and they're going to watch a video for maybe 60, or 60, min, uh, 60 seconds or, or two minutes, um, that's two more minutes they had on the web page, which is a strong engagement signal to Google, um, which correlates to higher rankings for that page. And I think it's even more powerful with podcasts because a two minute video is really long to me. I mean, for most people, right? It can be long, it can be short, but if you get on a podcast yeah. and somebody clicks on a podcast, you can be doing other things and you can listen to a podcast for five or 10 minutes while you're doing your email at your desk or doing something else. So you can actually stand it. So I think in terms of um, dwell time, video, and maybe to even a greater extent, a uh, podcast embedded podcast, Eddie, are two great ways to significantly increase dwell time on our website, which correlates directly with higher rankings for the page. So that's really important. But to me, videos, the most important is the way I try and use it for my sites, my client sites is, you know, getting, you mentioned conversions, getting people, we, in, in, in SEO, we do a really good job if we do it right and getting targeted traffic to the website. But that's just, that brings the horse to water, right? Once they're on there, you got to get them to drink, like you said. Um, and to do that, you got to get people to know, like, and trust you as quickly as possible. So um, having great content on there, having trust badges, having testimonials is really important, but then seeing you talk and preferably like you can see on my side, if you go to caseywebdesigner.com, yeah, you know, I've got me talking right away so people can get comfortable with who I am. But then I've got two other guys that are out there. One guy's, you know, locally, um, has um, some trust and one guy nationally has some trust. Um, and I had them saying nice things about me. So those types of videos, I think we can use other third party testimonials to kind of really increase that trust and help you close people. Um, on the site, hugely important. I mean, I saw it right when I launched my, my new website at the end of last year. And actually, basically, this is kind of gets into another topic, but after I read the Google search quality evaluators guidelines, I'll send a link to this. It's a 160 word um, page document that Google uses to educate its army of 10,000 search quality ev evaluators that it hires to <laughs> manual it manually check the results, right? So it's, just, it's layman's terms. It's a 160 page PDF. And you read through all the things that they're instructing these quality raters that are essentially manually checking the quality of the algorithm. It's my, I think it's just, you read it and you're just like, holy cow. Cause they're basically telling you the algorithm as you're reading it, as they tell these um, quality raters what to look for. And they use these acronyms. Uh, they use this one particular, in particular called EAT, Education, Authority, and Trust. And they're trying to drill it into these guys that are getting $10, $15 an hour to manually check search results. So they're telling you what to look for on a page because that's what they want their, their, their um, algorithm to alg algorithmically the check for, for, for quality. So they're looking for people to educate, demonstrate authority and demonstrate trust. Those are the three things they just hammer in this 160 page document. So I went and I read that. I was like, Holy cow, this is, I'm going to stray away from explaining just my products and services. I'm going to load my site up with education, authority and trust. So I got my trust badges. I've got video testimonials on, I got more third party proof proving to that, algorithm or that um, evaluator that I am worthy of um, these points through the algorithm. And it totally changes the way we've kind of designed websites since then. But, but that video really factors into this because with, with the last election cycle, you know, people already didn't trust the internet that much. Now they trust it even way less, right? Fake news, this and that you have to put and bake as much trust and authority in your website as possible to be able to gain those search engine points. And video, I think, is one of those key ways to do it. Have, establishing a podcast, another way. Blogging on a regular basis where you're proving your authority is another thing. You know, putting these testimonials up and that kind of stuff, all I think really, really super important. But if you think about, okay, I'm doing this to, in my case, get better search engine points, it also is dovetailing right in with um, conversion because those are the things that you go through the website and you're proving to people you're providing the evidence to them why you're the best choice, right? And you're providing third-party proof versus your own saying, you know, I'm the best out there, I'm the best. You've got all these other things out there through your associations, your trust badges, your videos, and your testimonials that you're providing this third-party proof to the algorithm, to the evaluator, to your potential client um, that you're, you're the best for that, um, for that search. So what's a trust badge? Uh, certification, BBB, an award. Anything where it's some third party proof or you've you've done something and some you've passed somebody else's, you know, test. Gotcha. A portfolio. I mean, anytime out there where it's like you go through my website, caseywebdesigner.com, it's got 
it's got my message at the top, my USP. Then I start showing badges. Then I start showing, you know, other third-party testimonials, book, you know, all sorts of you know, third-party things where I'm just trying to show people almost pre- present like it's a, um, you're in a court of law. You're just trying to pr- provide the evidence to people, you know, in that 30 you know seconds that they're hanging on your website, why you should be on their shortlist type of a thing. I'm um, totally different, I think, than the old way to design, which was just loading it up with the products and the services that you did without having any proof on there. And right. I totally flipped it around. You go on my page, it's just all proof and authority. And if you want to get into the actual specifics, some of it's on there, but I make you go deeper into the page if you want to dig down once I've got your trust. I mean, I, I was one, I, I was like 17th place in my seventh grade science fair. And I put that. <laughs> put know, it all, right man. There. Maybe put that on a second page. Yeah. Put a big okay. collage. Right. <laughs> but you know, it, I mean, that's just, I think, say, I mean, I'm not, you're the sales expert, not me, but I mean, look, you saying you're awesome is worth about a penny. Other people saying you're awesome is worth millions of times that, right? Look, that so. may be for mere mortals, but I'm a sales whisperer. When I say it, it matters, okay? It's, it's more than a penny. I'm, I'm just saying. I'm just saying. Uh, all right. Very cool. So, yeah, I, I've, I've used those badges. I don't know. I, I use them just because I thought they were cool. But, yeah, now it, it builds trust. So, But you're right. Nobody trusts anybody anymore. So um, everything you can do to, to tip the odds in your favor um, uh, we got to do it. Uh, I mean, so, so we kind of touched on older sites like mine and, and, um, consolidating. Um, so the, as I'm going through this, you know, myself, um, uh, like how important are, are dates, you know, should I put, Hey, SEO tips for 2018, but then I, then I got to go through and, you know, December of 2018, go find every single place that 2018 is listed and make sure and change it to 2019. I, this is a touchy one because it's probably a little bit on the gray hat thing, but I know for a fact when I go and I, I do this now, cause I've had some lists in 2017, 2016 um, lists on different websites that have ranked. <laughs> And the problem I saw in the past, like, gosh, I actually had the URLs with the year in it. So I went back on some of them and changed them to be more generic. And then I changed the page title um, and included the year and stuff like that. And boy, it, it worked out. I don't know if that's a loophole that's been around for the last 12, 24 uh, months, but so, a lot so of having the year in the beginning got you ranked. And then even if you remove the year, but kept the post updated, it, you maintain the position. Yeah. In fact, if you look on my book website, you do a search for best SEO. I had best SEO. What happened is last year I did, I did a list of best SEO tools, 2017. Um, and it ranked number one because of one of the most traffic sites that we got on our book, on our SEO for growth book website that I wrote with John Jans. And then I was like, geez, I don't want to lose that next year. So I went and actually changed the URL, took the date off of it and then redirected the old title. And then I made it the list for 2018. And now it ranks number, not only does it rank, I think it ranks number in the top three for best SEO tools. It's number one for best SEO tools, 2018. So I got it on there. Um, but I've also got it now. So, and I've done this in a few other times. It was just one recent one that we've done. Where did you go in? Of course, I went in and I updated a few things. So I, I signaled to Google that it actually has been updated. But I made some more generic um, changes to the, to the, to the URL. Mm-hmm. And I've updated the page title and stuff, and it works. I mean, it definitely works. Yeah. I've seen it. I don't know if you've ever, you've read. Um, I actually I tried it because I read uh, I read a post from Glenn Alsop. And if you're Viper Chill, he's kind of like um, kind of a hardcore SEO. Really pushes the the gray hat. I think envelope a little bit because he experiments with other stuff. But he shares. He writes these epic posts, and he gives you great examples on stuff that he's done. And he had done one where he had done this, and all he did is change like a couple things on the website, boost the thing. I was like, I'm going to try this with a couple, and it worked really good. So, again, I don't know if this is a loophole they're going to close, you know, one of these days, but I think going back, especially if you've got a post that ranks for a particular year thing, it sucks to just, you know, who's going to be looking for best SEO tools 2017 next, you know, later this year, next year, no one. Right. But so to be able to kind of still – um, update that post and build on it and keep that ranking um, for the next year. And maybe even just for the generic term, really super important. And I can see that that's worked on the n- number of posts right now. So yes, to your answer, will it last? Is this a loophole? I don't know, but it certainly has been working for the last you know 24 months and I'm not stopping until, you know, 
until it stops working. <laughs> so before I forget, what was the name of that Google 160 page document? Google search evaluator guidelines. Search evaluator guidelines. Now, so you mentioned um, Glenn. What about there? Is it Matt Cuts? Is he the old Sorry. guy? He was the old de facto spokesman for the WebSpan team. Okay. Um, and then he went on leave a couple of years ago, and then they ended up kind of just they kind of faded away. And I think we're for the government now. Um, oh wow! Okay. But he was the guy. Now there's. Um, uh, Mueller, uh, I can't think of his name, his first name. Right? Did you say Bueller? <laughs> Mueller. 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 <laughs> Mueller. Um, he's kind of the new, um, the new SEO. Right. Is, I can't think of why I'm not thinking of his name off the top of my head. Uh, we, I can look him up and, and link to him. Uh, but you mentioned, so your book uh, is SEO for growth, Right. Right. So, uh, John, John Jantz, I've met several times, have not had him on the podcast. So maybe you can, uh, pull his ear for me, uh, hint, hint, uh, yes. but, uh, I met him many times at shows, great guy. Um, so where should we send people? I'm going to link to your various websites. I've got them all here. SEO for growth.com KC. So that's Kansas city. Yeah. SEO pro.com KC web uh, and, and I would tell everybody listening, even if you're not in Kansas city, you know, uh, Phil can probably design your website, uh, but it's also worth it to notice, see what's working. And so if Phil has three websites, it's probably not by accident. So visit those sites and, and see what they look like. How do they reference one another? Do they reference one another? Uh, but for the book, it's, uh, it's SEO for growth.com, right? Yep. And that was a great, I mean, that's literally tried to just something where you boil down kind of the art of SEO piece. But and if you read through it, it's just, it's just all these, these pieces you want to go through your website, SEO, the keyword research, reputation management is so huge right now. Um, you know, because being able to go out there and get people to get that proof and then repurposing that I think is, is the biggest bang for the buck there is right now. Um, but yeah, we put it all up and then we actually go in the last it's page, uh, page 194, I think it is in the book. I mean, literally, so one of the, we built the book for a lot of different reasons, but one of it's literally like I'm going to have a meeting after this podcast where I'm going to go down and sit with a prospective client and say, this is everything that we do is in here. All the tactics, the whole strategy is in here. There's actually two pages that tells you what you need to be doing on a date. So you can do your own SEO in-house and do it if you've got the time to do it. Um, and the tactics are actually in here from the 2,500 word blog post to the 600 word type thing. So all that stuff is practically in there and it's really written for that. Cause I was like, gosh, we get a lot of people to come to us. We can't always do it. They don't have the budget or whatever. Here's everything that I've been doing the last 12 years that the engagement's basically in there. So um, that's why we, one of the reasons why we wrote it. And then when the customer complains that the price is too high, you just hit them over the knuckles with the book. kind of like the, the nuns used to in, in school. Exactly. Why not? <laughs> we gently tap them with this one, but if they really need to be knocked around, I use the art of SEO because it's. I will, don't make me. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Very nice. Well, good luck with that customer. Uh, I will link to everything. Uh, we've mentioned the links and um, find you on, on LinkedIn as well. So, um, Phil Singleton, all the way from Kansas City. Thanks yeah. for uh, spreading yeah. your uh, words of wisdom on SEO for us today, man. Thanks for having me on the show, Wes. You're the man. All right. Oh, hey, I, I'm going to use that as a quote. <laughs> I'm going to put it on a loop. Wes, you're the man. Wes, you're the man. All right, man. Phil, thanks for coming on. Have a great day. You too. Told you you were in for a treat, and I told you SEO is not dead. It is changing. It is shifting, and that's fine. Uh, be happy for that. Yes, it will take you a little bit of work maybe to update some of the things you have. Uh, but I'm telling you, my goal, uh, I've got over a thousand. Well, when I started this a couple of weeks ago, I had easily 1100, 1200 pages and posts. So I killed off. I don't know if I had to guess maybe 50 as I was going through some of the cleanups, uh, but I've already created one update. You know, it's not new, right? I took one podcast or one blog post that was mediocre and then I did a search in my HubSpot COS and looked under a certain tag for marketing, and I found four other posts 
that were decent but small. They were light content, 300 words, 500 words, uh, really probably 300 words. They were small. And so I pulled them all into one and then redirected those URLs into one. So my goal over this next year uh, is to cut my website down at least 50%. Uh, and I can see I can easily do that. Uh, but I, I'll be making the website better while reducing the number of posts. So ironically, the amount of content will probably go up because as I consolidated those four or five posts into one, I updated, I made new content. I, I had to tie things together and some of those were a little bit outdated. I did a little bit of research, uh, updated the links, you know, to more, uh, more modern, more up-to-date references. And so I didn't just put them together right? And just republish. I blended them together. So more content, but less posts. And then as I share this, so now I can do a couple things. Uh, and I'm still considering this and, and evolving. Um, Brian Dean mentions this. He only has, I think he said 37 or 35 blog posts on his whole website. And he's this huge SEO guy that ranks extremely well. But I could see doing one big update a week, right? Taking this older stuff. I may take four or five articles, six articles that have been created over the last year to five or even seven years, some even longer and put a new publish date. Okay. And then now I share that. So now I can put out one big definitive post on a subject every single week. And yeah, it takes a little bit of work, but not as much work as if I created from scratch. But then if I wanted to as well, I could still go into other topics, other posts that may be a little more time less and share those on social media to continue the dialogue as uh, Phil was mentioning. So there's a couple of options there, you know, ways to stay in front, but then there's also, you know, I had Dennis Yu on the show and his $1 a day promotion. So I'm starting to do a little bit of paid traffic, uh, to get out in front of people. So you can see my smiling pearly whites a little bit more, and that helps build a little bit of brand awareness. Uh, so then you're looking for things cause I still have daily, uh, posts and things that I share through social media as well. But the main thing is, Doing all this with SEO in mind. When I started my business, I was very focused on SEO. I used that Yoast SEO tool. I used WordPress. Uh, I used good SEO practices in naming my images, naming my videos, uh, using uh, YouTube to a um, to a good degree, and using it properly for the most part, even though it was all self-taught kind of stuff. Uh, but all of that helped me get the word out and grow my business. Okay. But I have to admit, I got a little lazy, uh, and a little demotivated kind of at the same time, or maybe the demotivation created the laziness. I don't know. Uh, as things shifted with Infusionsoft, uh, as I had different issues with the different teams I've tried to bring on over the years, uh, I got, I didn't produce as much content. I wasn't as motivated. Uh, my podcast was usually the only content I would create from scratch for weeks at a time. And this, this has gone on for years, uh, at least two years, maybe three. And, um, so then even though I had the power of HubSpot to do a lot of SEO, um, to do it properly, right. To analyze, to optimize, I would just slap this stuff up, you know, Hey, here's some notes, here's some links. Uh, here's a good interview. Go knock yourself out. But, um, I got a, got a spring in my step again, shall we say? Uh, and it's, it is very detail oriented work when you do SEO, right? But the payoffs are just, they're so long term and so far reaching, you know, it really is worth it. Um, so take the time, you know, listen to, to podcasts like this, do your own research. Then if you hire somebody like Phil or hire somebody like me, you'll know what to expect. You'll know what you're getting into. Uh, so they can't pull the wool over your eyes. Okay. And, and again, go check out the notes. I linked to several other SEO experts as well that I've had over the years. Uh, I've had uh, Danny Starr on, of course, uh, Backlinko, uh, Brian Dean. Uh, I wrote an article as well. I spoke at Entrepalooza, Entreport's 
a big conference a couple of years ago, uh, and I give a presentation on SEO. And it doesn't get way down in the weeds, but it was the fundamental things you do need to do and things that I have done my whole career, which is fortunate for me. Again, I continue to pay off. But even as a novice, it can help. Uh, but if you're if you're intermediate, you'll still get some benefit out of, out of that as well. So I link to that um, in this episode. Uh, and you know, come over, hang out with us, uh, check out the new Inner Circle. Uh, I'm gonna be linking to that. I'll be talking about that a good bit, and then working on the mastermind. Uh, but remember, if you can't make the sale, if you do all of this and the phone rings and you can't close the sale, if you do this and they come into your office and you can't close the sale. You need to make every sale program. We forget that you know unless you're able to do this truly in your sleep, you have a 100% e-commerce site, you're doing all this to have a visitor turned into a lead, turned into a prospect, turned into a client. That's selling. Okay? That's where the make every sale course comes in. So avail yourself of that and then join us in the inner circle. But for now, thanks for listening. Go sell something.